Welcome back to the Joyful Catholic Leaders Show, where you'll hear stories and insights from those who lead with faith, from the seminary to the parish to the classroom to the office to the sports field and everywhere in between. Today, we are honored to be joined by Father Donald Calloway, author of The Consecration to St. Joseph, The Wonders of Our Spiritual Father, and a remarkable priest with a remarkable story. Father Calloway is a member of the Congregation of Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary. He's led tours to Marian shrines around the world, including with actor Jim Caviezel. He's known in many circles as the surfing priest, and yet these are might not be the most interesting things about him. In fact, they probably aren't. Looking forward to hearing his story and some of his insights on the priesthood today. Father, thank you so much for taking some time out of your crazy schedule to, to join us today. Yeah, no problem at all. Glad to do it. Um, yeah, God has been good to me, brother, for sure. And I'm I'm just trying to bring as many souls to him now as I possibly can. So, yeah, Amen. Thank you. Amen. That's uh, that's that's always the the end goal. That's the idea. So, um, you know, one of my favorite things about this line of work is getting to hear different priests vocation stories. Um, every single uh, man with the collar has one. Uh, but then there's yours, uh, <laughs> you know, um, seen other interviews with you online before um, and one of the things that always strikes me is when you talk about kind of your upbringing and, and the growth you've experienced in your conversion to the church, it almost feels like you're, you're telling a story about a completely different person and you have to sort <laughs> of bring yourself back and remember, you know, this is, this is the same guy. So um, right. let's just start with your story, Father, kind of the, the Cliff Notes version of how you first came to the faith and, and then to the priesthood. I know you've told it a thousand times, yeah. but uh, I know our audience would love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. No problem at all. Um, yeah, so I wasn't raised in a Christian Catholic household at all, and growing up, that was completely foreign to me. I didn't believe in God. I was baptized when I was 10, but that was in the Episcopalian Church, and only because my stepfather's parents, my new grandparents, insisted on it, and we didn't go to church after that. And so I very much was a product of the world and got involved in very sinful, uh, immoral activity as a young boy. And then it got so bad that we as a family, as a military family at that point, my stepfather was in the military. Uh, we were living in Japan and I got uh, involved in a criminal organization, got kicked out of the country. But through all that craziness, my parents became Catholic. And then I went to two drug and alcohol rehabilitation centers. I got thrown in jail when I was 18 in Louisiana. And it took some time, but through my mom's prayers and sacrifices, um, I had what I call the divine two by four experience when I was 21 and just fell madly in love with God, with Jesus Christ, with the Catholic Church, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with the saints and had a radical conversion. And then that's shortly after that, that's when I got my call uh, to become a Catholic priest. So it's the last thing I ever thought that I would be doing in my life. But um, the God I didn't know had um, plans for me and a lot of mercy for me. So. I'm extremely grateful. And now I've been a priest almost 20 years Wow! and write, yeah, write books and travel around and trying to let souls know that there's mercy for them and that uh, God is real and that he loves them. Sure. Well, you're a living testament to that. So diving a little deeper, you mentioned the, the criminal organization in, in Japan. You were basically a drug runner, right? Or tell me, tell me a yep. little more about that. Yeah, so when we were there, um, we were there for, well, we should have been there for three years, but I, I so messed it up, we had to leave. Um, but I, 15 years old was when I was a drug mule for the Yakuza, the Yakuza in Japan. Not a lot of people over here know what that is, but no. it's, it's a criminal organization that runs, you know, drugs and money. And it's very serious stuff in Japan. And they never fully initiate, you know, little white boys like myself. But they used me as a, as a drug mule to take things to different casinos and, and places. Sure. And it was an insane life. It was, I was only 15, and I was running loose in Japan doing that. And it caused an international scene. So thank God I wasn't killed um, or became a casualty in any way because of that. It was bad. Yeah, crazy. How, how do you get from there to converting to the church? <laughs> well... Um, I always joke around with my mom. Um, I always tell her, mom, I'm the reason you found God. <laughs> you know, there you, you go. needed to yeah. deal with me. You know? <laughs> so she doesn't laugh at that one, but it's true. <laughs> um, so when they had their own conversion, you know, they became super Catholic. So they bought tons of books about our Lord, about the saints, about our lady. Well, when I hit my rock bottom, when I was uh, t going on 21 
um, I went out to their bookshelf in the hallway and picked up a book on Our Lady about apparitions. And yeah. I didn't even know what that was. And that book was the catalyst that got me looking into stuff and questioning, wait, am I the one who's been deceived? Because I always thought that religion was crazy for crazy people. Um, and so that got me to go to a Catholic church and encounter zealous on fire Catholics that taught me stuff. And then I realized my parents weren't nuts, that they were right. And that is when I enrolled in RCIA and uh, went through the process of becoming Catholic myself. What, what do you think made you pick up that book? Like of any book you could have grabbed off the shelf? Yeah, well, definitely it was Divine Providence, right? Yeah. So, but that particular night, I was at my ultimate rock bottom. And I had a lot of those experiences. You know, I've been in two rehabs. I've been in yeah. jail and lived a crazy life. But that particular night, um, I was at my ultimate low. I didn't even want to be here anymore. Mm. And um, I went out. I was actually looking for a National Geographic. <laughs> I didn't want to look <laughs> at anything religious. You found a little more than that. <laughs> yeah, I did. And I pulled it off the shelf. And I'm like, what is this? And started going through it. And next thing you know, um, the morning came. I would stayed up all night. And that's when I told my mom that I wanted to talk to a Catholic priest. Wow. And, and this is something we joke about to this day too. My mom, you know, it's like six o'clock in the morning and I'm trying to tell her, I want to talk to a Catholic priest. And I had long hair down to my waist at this point. And she said, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, she yeah. thought I was joking. Yeah. And I was mom, I'm serious. What is this stuff? And uh, everything just snowballed from there. That's awesome. Um, so another part of your story I kind of picked up on was you, you kind of had a, a beautiful encounter with with the Eucharist shortly after you picked up that book, and um, mm -hmm. you even have described it as you heard a voice, and the voice said, "You know, worship." Um, walk us through that, and and you really knew that God was speaking to you at that time, even coming from, yeah. you know, the the place you were coming from. Um, how yeah. did you know? What made you so certain that that God was speaking to you in that moment? Yeah, that it's an incredible thing because I've I've never had that happen since then. Yeah, but. It was the next day, right? I read that book. I went to see a Catholic priest, and he told me he had to. He would talk to me after he did this thing called celebrate mass. I didn't even know what that was, so I'm like, whatever. Yeah. And you know, told me go over to the chapel, and then he came over, and he started doing all kind of stuff I was completely unfamiliar with. I'd never been to church, and so all of a sudden he bends over and he picks up this little white circle and he says, "Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body," and he holds it up. And initially, I have to say, I thought the man was a lunatic because he just told us that's his body and we got to eat it. That's what he said. And I thought, this is crazy talk. But then he just stood there. And that's when I heard a voice. And it wasn't a voice that was spoken to my ear. It was a voice that was spoken to me. And that's extremely hard to even explain. I don't even understand it. It was spoken to me inside yeah. of me. And the voice said to me, worship. And I don't know where this came from but i just had like an infusion of knowledge that i knew that that was jesus christ what that man was holding in his hands was god somehow i didn't understand terms like blessed sacrament or holy communion or eucharist i didn't know what, he, what those would have been but it was jesus and so then he put down jesus and he picked up that you know chalice and he said take this all of you and drink from it and he held it up and i heard the same voice worship and i had the same experience of knowing that that was God. And I went to the priest after and told him, and I completely freaked him out because he's like, <laughs> you heard what? And I'm like, yeah, I did. You didn't hear it? I thought everybody heard it. And wow. he said, no. And I'm like, what? I'm like, because there was nobody in that church but him, five Filipino women up front, and me in the back. That was it. Wow. And yeah, it's just it daily incredible. mass, right? Yeah, just a daily mass. Yeah. And oh, uh, wow. Yeah, I've never had that happen since then, but wow <laughs> it was incredible for yeah sure. set you on an amazing path you mentioned mm -hmm. um your mother had her own conversion experience and then uh was it your stepfather too that, that yep. converted as well so i mean yep. they went That's right. through a similar journey um and yep. they all at some point in in that process as they're converting say i gotta go talk to a priest just like you did um yeah now you're a priest yeah. yourself Wh what what an honor, but what role does, does the priest play in conversion stories like that? Like what is, is the priest's role in that moment? Because you, you know, like you said, you, you kind of floored the guy a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure my mom probably floored the one that she talked to too. <laughs> you know, she had, she had a past herself, you know, sure. she was no saint at that point. Um, 
So, yeah, the, the role of a priest is so amazing because he's an intermediary. He's the one that God uses to bring people to himself. He's, he's a mediator, right? Jesus is the one great mediator, but because he's so good, he sends out apostles to help and can continue with his saving work. And so a priest is, does that in a particular way. So I know my mom told me that when she talked to that, na- that Navy chaplain that she talked to in Japan, that's where she had talked to the sure. priest. He told her about the Eucharist, about confession. He told her in particular, she recounted to me later, um, uh, the story about a holy mother named Monica, St. Monica, and her delinquent, arrogant son named Augustine. Not yet St. Augustine, but Augustine the sinner. And that story... I mean, it, my mom's so identified with that. You know, she as a mother was hurting and her, her son, me, was causing so much pain. She herself needed her own relationship with Jesus. And then she could offer up her sacrifices and her prayers for her delinquent son. And that story of, of Monica and Augustine really um, did something to my mother. And she began to pray to St. Monica. And um, it's, it's an amazing story because years later, um me and my mother were in rome together and i was already ordained a priest yeah i surprised her by she didn't know i was going to do this we were in rome and we had all these plans and i said mom i got a special surprise and she said what i said we're going to go to the tomb of saint monica and we're going to pray in thanksgiving and that was a tear filled event i mean oh my gosh it was amazing (laughs) it was awesome (laughs) yeah incredible incredible so so you're you're your story is sort of these these leaps and bounds. You go from being a drug mule in Japan to converting, yeah. and then you make this leap at some point from converting to to discerning the priesthood. What was that part of the experience like? You know, you, you converting is one yeah. thing, but then to um, to discern right. the priesthood is obviously its own journey in and of itself. Yeah, it, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, when I had my initial conversion experience, I didn't know what God was asking of me or yeah. wanting from me. And I just assumed that, well, probably calling me to get married and have a Catholic family and, you know, have lots of babies, that, you know, that'd be great. Um, but as I thought about that, and as awesome as it is, I just didn't feel at peace with that. But every day when I was going to Mass, even while I was becoming Catholic, so I wasn't even Catholic yet, and I was going to daily Mass, I wasn't receiving communion because I wasn't Catholic, but I went during my lunch break. And every time I watched the priest say Mass or go in the back and hear confessions, I felt so drawn to that, and I felt so at peace with the possibility of that. And I didn't think it would be possible for me because of my past, but then I I talked to priests, I talked to others, and they said, no, you should look into it, and I did, and I went and visited my religious community, that that long name you read at the beginning of my religious community. For short, we go by Marian Fathers. (laughs) Our name is very long, but we just were Marian Fathers. Um, And I visited them and it felt like home and such good men, men of the church. And um, yeah, I, I I discerned that God wanted me to be there. And yeah. Sure. So where did you go through seminary formation then? Do the Marian fathers have a seminary or what did that look like for you? Yeah. So we're a smaller congregation. We don't have huge numbers like a lot of the other religious communities. So um, they had me do my philosophy and pre-theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville, sure. which is awesome. I mean, that's that was a fantastic experience for me. And then the seminary that we send our guys to is in Washington, D.C. We have a house in Washington, D.C., and right across the street is the Dominican House of Studies. It's a okay. seminary, and it's, fant- it's completely orthodox. You study St. Thomas Aquinas. You get really good, good theology. And that um, that was a great experience for me. It wasn't easy. I mean, Dominicans are like hardcore, you know, theologians. Yeah. But it was it was great. It was really great. What are uh, one or two of your best memories from seminary? Oh, man, Um, probably just um, the classes on virtue, Mm because a lot of times it's a pontifical seminary. So we took you know, we unpacked what is prudence what is fortitude what is charity what isn't it and all making all those distinctions that's the classic stuff of of a dominican is distinctions 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 and sometimes you know you're you're dying because you're like oh how many more distinctions do we have to get (laughs) but going in and knowing the human person knowing what our emotions are what our passions are what is right reason 
what is original sin, how that affects us. That kind of stuff for me was fascinating because I never knew that stuff. I, I wasn't aware of that. And, and that really, for me, solidified so much um, that it built a foundation for me that even now, I mean, 20 years later, ordained, um, I look back at that stuff and I'm grateful for what I learned. Sure. Um, I do have to ask you, do you still listen to Grateful Dead or any other classic rock bands that you kind of use to describe maybe your, your formal self and some of the, the cultural things that you're into? you still a classic rock guy? I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I mean, I, I mean, come on, who, who can't crank out, you know, Sweet Home Alabama when it comes on the radio in the car, turn it up, you know, but yeah, uh, it's irresistible. So that is true. It is. You know what I mean? So, or, or back in black, right? Especially now, you know, that's my, that's my song, man, you know, but I, there's certain things I can't listen to. Like if they're singing about hell or yeah. extremely sinful activity, no, I can't listen to those songs. I can't be running with the devil anymore. You know what I mean? Those kind of songs from the past, I can't listen to those things. But that doesn't mean I shut it all out and get rid of all of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I do. I listen to a lot of reggae from my past. I listen to, a, you know, some of the Grateful Dead, classic rock, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, yeah, as uh, the son of a boomer who, who was raised on, on progressive and classic rock, I can definitely appreciate that. So that's good. <laughs> lot, to, lot to be gleaned there. Uh, tell us a little more about your community, Father. Like you mentioned, the Marian Fathers maybe aren't as, as well known as the dominicans or, or franciscans or benedictines but um yeah what's what are some of your charisms and daily life and and you obviously uh, love being a part of it yeah so we were founded in poland in the 17th century by saint stanislas papczynski not very well known outside of poland but an amazing saint um and the primary charisms or or apostolate that we have is to promote devotion to our lady especially her immaculate conception and here's something super cool is we're the first men's community in the church to have the title Immaculate Conception in our name. There you go. Um, yeah, we were founded in 1670. The dogma of the Immaculate Conception did not happen until 1854. So our founder was a real prophetic in that. And so that's our main charism, devotion to Our Lady and her Immaculate Conception. We pray for the souls in purgatory and we help out in parishes. We help diocesan and priests with masses, confession, spiritual direction, all those things. And then something that we're really well known for, but it was kind of a later addition because of our Polish heritage, during the pontificate of St. Uh, Pope John Paul II, we were entrusted with spreading the message of divine mercy, as was given to St. Faustina, um, because of our Polish origin. So our founder, we were founded way before St. Faustina and all of that, but because we had the means to spread it after World War II, um, St. John Paul II said to our community, you are to be the ones to promote this under the banner of Mary. And so we've been doing that. We're the official ones. If you look at practically anything on Divine Mercy, you'll see copyrights, Marian Fathers, Stockbridge, Massachusetts. You know, it's, we're kind of well known for that. Amazing. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, you're known as the surfing priest. How often are you able to surf these days? Uh, what do you like about it? Um, yeah. Uh, are there parallels from surfing to, to the faith that you can draw? It's, it's, it's definitely not an easy endeavor. I've, I've never done it myself, but I know it's something that takes a yeah. lot a lot of work. It does, yeah. And you got to keep in shape relatively. I mean, it's, it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. I've been doing it since I was a little kid. But, um, yeah, I, I do it as much as I can. Obviously, I don't do it as much as I would like or as I, I could because I'm busy. I'm a priest first. You know, that surfing is secondary stuff. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of parallels. I mean, you think about it, Jesus walked on water, right? <laughs> I'm not saying he was a surfer, of course, but <laughs> um, there's something to be said about the beauty of a beach. I mean, oh, when yeah. you're drawn to it, you, you never want to leave, right? When you were a little kid, if you ever went, your parents practically had to drag you off that beach because it, it turns you into a kid. I mean, you know, Dr. Peter Kreeft, he, um, he has a trilogy of books on surfing. Um, everybody knows him as a great philosopher and thinker, and he is, but he actually... Um, love to surf you know now he's up there older and probably doesn't do it as much as he used to for sure but there's something you know even surfers talk about the green room or the green cathedral that's what a barrel is called to surfers the the green cathedral and they talk about it as their morning church literally that's how they describe their local surf break and they are more pious and devout than many people are <laughs> I mean, 
they they order their lives around surfing. I mean, they won't get jobs or careers where they have to be at work before 10 and where they can get summers off so they can go surf in Indonesia and Bali and Costa Rica and Australia. That's just, you know, man, if we Christians were that zealous in going to, you know, the practice, doing the practice of our faith, that'd be something, you know. Um, so there, there's definitely some, some similarities and, and, and parallels there. Yeah, no question. Your faith journey, I think you said it started with with a deep devotion to to the Eucharist, but also to Mary. You've been you've been kind of drawn to Mary from the beginning. How did that influence the devotion you developed to Saint Joseph that that ultimately ended up in you know the calling to write the consecration to Saint Joseph? Oh, there's so many things you know that when I was introduced to Our Lady in a deeper way by these little Filipino women who helped me to pray the Rosary and got me reading like St. Louis de Montfort and St. Alphonsus de Liguori and all these great saints of what they wrote about Our Lady. You know, I have to say, I almost became spiritually jealous of St. Joseph because I was like, man, you got to marry this woman. You yeah. were her husband yeah. in this chaste marriage. And then I read things by Venerable Fulton Sheen where he said, every man, when he desires to marry a woman, ultimately desires to marry the Blessed Virgin, the perfect woman. And I'm like, right? I'm like, She's like the masterpiece of femininity. I mean, her beauty is so amazing. She, she elevates manhood. She makes you a knight and a warrior and a soldier for truth. And so I wanted to be like St. Joseph. And then I discovered many saints who actually said in their relationship with Our Lady that they wanted to be like a second St. Joseph in that relationship. And so I thought, wow, I would love to have that spirituality, that chivalrous kind of relationship with Our Lady. And so... Who else are you going to look to but St. Joseph? So, I mean, all he's the greatest Marian saint of all time. He's the first one totally consecrated to her. He's the first one to call her my lady. He's the first, the first, the first of all of this. So yeah. um, I, I just, it was a no-brainer for me to go to him and want to be like him. And then now, of course, writing the consecration to St. Joseph to make him more known because he's been misunderstood. He's the character in the background nobody pays attention to. But um, I'm trying to change that and, and to bring him more to the forefront. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned some of these in the book, but what were one or two things that as you, you went through that process and, and put the book together, you learned about St. Joseph that, that you didn't know before? Oh, tons. I yeah. mean, I would have to say the majority of the book because like most people, I'm like, I don't know. He's just some dude that God chose to do this and kind of stepped out of the picture and I didn't yeah. know a lot. So the things that really amazed me though, were like the, what's called the Santo Anello, the, the wedding ring, the Holy ring that Joseph gave to the blessed Virgin Mary for their wedding. It's still in existence. It's housed in a gigantic reliquary <clears throat> in the cathedral in Perugia, Italy, about 30 minutes from Assisi. It's still there and you can go there and it's exposed once or twice a year for the, for the faithful to venerate, and the bishop actually allows married couples to touch their ring to the Santo Anello, to the Holy Ring. Um, you can Google it and see it. It's amazing. Who knew, right? Yeah. Um, that, and then like his titles for me were impressive. Um, the guy that I didn't know much about, but I prayed to all the time and, and wanted to be like, I found it so awesome that his title, one of his titles is the Terror of Demons. That is like the money title. What man doesn't want people to say about him? That man is a terror of demons. That's like, right. Well, that's 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 such a that's the heavyweight champion title. That's he's got the defending belt. I mean, that guy is amazing. So, what makes him that? Well, his purity, and his you know relationship with Jesus, and so that I I want to be like that. I want to be a terror of demons. I want to be like Saint Joseph. So those are some of the things of many, and there's many that just just blew me away. Sure. We recently, as a church, wrapped up the year of St. Joseph, uh, which was, which was, you know, an awesome devotion mm. called for by Pope Francis. Now that that year on the calendar is behind us, what are some practical ways that, that we can uphold and stay devoted to St. Joseph? Obviously, just because you hit a point on the calendar, none of those, those truths that you were just talking about go away. Right. Yeah, no, good point, because we want, we want the follow-through swing, right? Knock the ball out of the park and keep that relationship with him going. So, obviously, if, you, if people listening have not done the consecration to St. Joseph yet, do that. 
Um, because in there, you're going to learn about things that you can continue to do for the rest of your life. So, for example, Wednesdays have traditionally been devoted to St. Joseph, just like Saturdays in the Catholic world are devoted to Our Lady. Every devout Catholic knows when, when you wake up in the morning on a Saturday, every Catholic just knows it's Our Lady's Day. It's Saturday, right? Well, Wednesdays have been devoted to St. Joseph. We kind of forgot about that for a, a period of time, but now there's a it's coming back and um, you can do certain practices. Buy a lily for St. Joseph on a Wednesday. Recite the litany of St. Joseph by yourself or as a, a couple or as a family um, on Wednesdays in his honor. Or the rosary, right? You know, devout Catholics love the rosary. And so, you know, think about the joyful mysteries. Joseph is involved in those five joyful mysteries. So if you pray those in the cycle that we do with the mysteries, you pray the joyful mysteries twice a week. Why not now? Include St. Joseph in your meditations when you're meditating upon those particular mysteries um, when you're praying them during the week. So you can do that for the rest of your life. Um, and I tell people, buy a beautiful statue of St. Joseph. One where he's, you know, doesn't look like he's about 105 and about to die, right? One where he's young and attractive and strong and masculine, holding the Christ child or something and, and place it in a prominent area of your home. Um, lovely things that you can do so that you don't forget his importance and, and, and how he wants to be a part of your life. Yeah, for sure. Super, super practical, but, but super profound. Uh, thank you for that. That's great. You travel a lot. What's your yeah. schedule like and how do you kind of handle that? Yeah, it is crazy for sure. Um, the cool thing is that during the pandemic, you know, I wasn't traveling that much. So that, that was kind of good. I kind of got to lay low a little bit and yeah. grew a big old beard during, I had my pandemic beard, you know, super cool. Looked homeless basically. <laughs> um, I did. It was kind of scary. My mom's like, when are you going to get rid of that thing? Um, yeah. So I've been a priest almost 20 years now. So the first few years of my priesthood, the traveling and everything was challenging because I didn't know how to say no. And I would say yes to everything, including food and staying up till midnight at people's homes. And they're bringing family members over and more food and it got crazy. I gained a lot of weight. My prayer life suffered. My sleep mm. suffered. It just wasn't good. So I had to learn how to say no at, with kindness and love, of course. Um, and so now I've, I've got a pretty good system where I tell people at my events, look, I'm sorry, but I, I have to be back either to the rectory or the hotel or wherever it is I'm saying by no later than 9 p.m. I refuse to do anything past 9 p.m. because I need to make my, do my prayers. Um, I need to get a good night's sleep. And when I set those kind of limits, people respect that. And I'll tell them in, in, in anticipation, please don't kind of like just run me around and throw food at me constantly. No disrespect to you and your culture, because certain cultures, you know, these are, these are big things. You know, you go to these big meals and they got piles of food. And I respect that and I'll nibble on things, but I want to be healthy too. You know, I, I don't want to be, you know, overweight and I don't want to feel sluggish, you know, so... Um, I learned how to set those standards and get my prayers in, get my sleep in, get physical activity in, all those things. And, um, and I'm very connected to my community. I'm the vocation director for my community. So I'm the guy out there recruiting and doing the fishing, you know, getting the guys in. Sure. Uh, and I love doing that. And I'm a, going to constant meetings with the community for personnel, finance, you know, all those kind of issues and got a few leadership positions in the community. So it keeps me grounded, you know, keeps, keeps me, uh, focused as well. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure staying grounded is important, especially when you have a story like you do and um, you're so gracious enough to, to go tell it to where, you know, there are videos of you telling it on YouTube with hundreds of thousands of views. Like people know who you are, you know, um, how, how do you, how do you stay grounded other than, is it just those daily disciplines? I mean, I'm sure prayer is a big part of it, but I mean, how do you, how do you handle the, the, the fame or attention or whatever the right word is? Yeah, I know. I, yeah, it's funny because I, you know, on social media, they call you, you have fans, right? I yeah, understand you're an I'm influencer. Friends, right? Yeah, well, that's what they say, right? I, I'm not a guru or anything, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a dude, man, I'm, and I'm a <laughs> priest, so I, I yeah. want to save souls. Yeah. And people may look at me like I'm somebody special, but I know who I am. I know I put my pants on just like everybody else. Yep. And, you know, God doesn't love me more than he loves them. And so I know my own weaknesses and, and you know, what I say in confession. So, yeah, it, <laughs> my own brokenness humbles me. So I'm grateful that um, I'm able to help people. But at the same time, I'm trying to cross that finish line just like everybody else. So um, I need their prayers and we're in this together. Awesome. 
one more and we'll get you out of here. Kind of generic, but um, and maybe you've, you've touched on this in our last couple uh, exchanges here, but how do you stay joyful or how do you how do you live joy in your priesthood? Yeah, I would definitely say without prayer, forget it, because, yeah. um, you know, it's very easy today to look at, especially things on social media and the news and just get so bummed out, sarcastic, depressed and just all hope sucked out of your life because everything just seems so gloomy. And granted, yes, we are living in difficult times without a doubt. But when you pray, you remember this is all passing and my God is in love with me and I'm in love with him. And yes, there are things out there that are horrible, but you know what? I have to focus on my little area right here in front of me, not what's going on over here or over there or looking at comparing over there. Just let me focus on what it is that I've been assigned to do and be at peace. And that's where for me, the, the joy comes is, you know, yes, the, I, who can deny that there's crazy stuff going on in the world and even in the church. We have oh, yeah. infighting and all of that. Lord, I leave it up to you. I'm doing my part to be holy and help others become holy, making myself available for, for your people um, and, you know, giving you what is yours, adoring you, worshiping you. And so I can go to bed at night and, and, and be at peace. Um, took me a while to get that balance again, right? Because like most men, I'm a fighter. You know, if, if you say something to me, I'm, I'm going to swing back, you yeah. know? Um, but it, it took me a while to, to realize, okay, you know what? This isn't my particular battle. That's not my diocese. This isn't what's going on. Is it right or wrong? Yeah, I got my thoughts on those issues, but yeah. that's not my battle. I got a battle right here. <laughs> Let me fight my own little battle right here, you know? Sure. So, and you can keep joy in that because you realize, you know, you don't have to walk around with a chip on your shoulder and just looking for a fight, you know? Because a lot of people do that today. They're just like in fight mode constantly. Like, hey, hey, you know, relax at ease, soldier, right? You fight yeah. your battle. But you don't have to fight everybody else's battle. You know? That's right. Oh, yeah. So much wisdom. Um, well, thank you so much, Father. I feel like I could uh, to waste even more of your time and talk to you in a lot more uh, time than we have here. But thank you so much for being so gracious with your time and, and joining us today yep. and, and sharing your story. Thanks, Fantastic. man. I appreciate it. God bless you and keep up the good work, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, too, for joining us on this edition of the Joyful Catholic Leaders Show. Be sure to subscribe wherever you find your podcasts and follow both the St. Paul Seminary and St. John Vianney College Seminary on social media and at semsp.org. New episodes drop every month on the first Friday of the month in honor of Our Lady of Fatima and the most sacred heart of Jesus. Thanks for listening and God bless.